right on the nose. So my name is June Simeonoff Pardue. I was born in Old Harbor Village on Kodiak Island. Um, back then we didn't have any midwives. So it was a couple other uh, ladies in the village who delivered me uh, along with Lucy Crowder and there was um, Elena Capjohn and Annie um, Alexandra. Those were the midwives and they were trained in the old, old way, the Alutic way. Back in those days, they would put the, the, the pregnant woman who, who went into delivery on the bed. And then one midwife would sit at the head of uh, the one that was delivering on the bed. And, and then she would cradle um, her, her shoulders on her legs and, and do the head massages and, and the face massages and, and the shoulders while the, while the woman at the foot of the bed was actually doing the delivery, okay? And usually the one at the head of the bed was the coach. And that's, that's what I gathered because there was, <laughs> there was a time when I had to deliver a baby in Old Harbor and called on Noma, uh, Nomoff, Eleanor Nomoff had to come and help me. Uh, back in those days, you know, we didn't have clinics or hospitals in, in the villages uh, to deliver babies uh, because everyone was sent to Kodiak and to Anchorage for that to happen. And um, they came up with a state or PHS came up with uh, uh, regulations to where health aides could no longer deliver babies in the villages, you know, so the health aide couldn't go there to help the lady that was delivering. And um, Elena Kapjohn, who was the one of the traditional midwives who was there when I was born, um, misunderstood that I had a job there in the village, you know, to, because my office was, <laughs> where the health aide had her office in the clinic building. And she thought that I was uh, trained to be, a, for some reason, a health practitioner, and I wasn't. All I was was just an, a lady there, who young person there to help elders if they needed anything, food delivery or visitation or something like that, you know? So anyways, I helped deliver a baby and know what, it, what it's like um, to be in a village where there is no hospital. I love that I was raised in a village in, in traditional ways. You know, we grew up living off of the land and then we had values that were passed down to us that we don't often hear today, um, especially if we're living in, in, you know, like Anchorage or Wasilla and, uh, you know, the school system is different. It wasn't small like those of us living in the village. And one of the things that they taught it was taught us uh, you know, was that um, we do have our spirituality, you know, so when I say Kriyana Chaim, I say, thank you, creator, uh, you know, Deluji, come here, you know, and, and it's something that I was raised with, especially when I was traveling over to Kaguyak village, and I loved visiting Kaguyak. That place was wiped out by the 1964 earthquake and tidal wave, and relatives moved from there to Akiak village. But when I was a little girl and, and had to go over there to be with relatives, I was just fascinated with, they didn't have a store. Everything was hand sewn. You know, they, the women would, were just so happy when they opened up a new sack of flour because they knew that the, the printed flowers on the flower bag would be something that they could hand sew. And they didn't have patterns. You couldn't run down to Joanne Fabrics to get anything, you know, to, to, to make. You know, let's say if somebody wanted to make a sewing kit, a sewing bag, they couldn't go to Joanne Fabrics to get a pattern. They just had to figure out how to do it on their own at home. And so, I'm here at the Sheldon Jackson Museum. This is what leads to the, sew the sewing kit. And it was like about 25 years ago, the uh, Sheldon Jackson Museum started sending for me, you know, not just me, but other artists would come and we'd rotate in and out of here to take a look at what they have in their collections and not only just in their collections, you know, but um, 
in for, for the public to view, but also there's a room where they have real nice things that uh, you have to wear gloves to touch anything, you know. And, and for years I've been looking at sewing bags, but most of the ones that they have here are made out of salmon skin, which is really fascinating. So let me show you some of the salmon skins that I tan right here. And the and compared to what they have in in the collection, this is just as soft and just as soft yeah. as what they have, yeah. what the women had to work with in the 1800s were using yeah. salmon skins to make articles. So the picture that you saw with the friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum uh, uh, about this live yeah. class is a cathedral, a sewing bag made out of salmon skins and then out of material. I was studying the material and I'm going, oh my God, that was probably recycled material, nice thick material that they used, you know, to put the pocket in. So I'm going to open mine and we're going to talk about what, what would be the sewing bag. So here's mine. It's flashy, you know, uh, it's not so traditional looking because I believe that uh, we don't stand still in time. And then here's the inside. Actually, the material was kindly given to me by a lady here in uh, Sitka last year. She just had a big container full and she goes, I don't know what you're gonna do with these, all, this, all these scraps. And you know how it is when we grew up in the village, we used everything and anything that came to us, we you know, were welcomed having it. So here's my sewing kit. And I'm just gonna talk about what I have in my kit today. And I'll pull things out of the pockets one at a time. And first I wanna share with you where I have my needles. I put these two heavy felt strips right here and I have several types of needles. I've got a skin sewing needle way up here. I've got a long, sharp, uh, sewing needle for, oh, in case I want to work on lining for something like these salmon skin and deer hide boots that I'm working on. Okay. And then I might want to have tiny little beading um, needles like what's up here on this corner. You can hardly see them. We'll get the light to shine on them. Okay, so that when I'm traveling and carrying small articles with me that I'm working on, then I can have all of those tools. Okay, so we talked about the needles. And then let's pull something out of the pocket up here. And up here I have a salmon leather and uh, she skin, she fish leather backing for these little traveler scissors. Okay, so here we go. There's the scissors, wonderful. And then um, nowadays, I need a lighter to burn my thread and knots, okay? And you'd just be surprised how much you can fit into these little bags right here, your sewing kit. And then I'll pull this package out and I have every kind of needle you could think of in here. I have skin sewing needles in various sizes and I have beading needles in various sizes. And these are called glove, uh, uh, John James bead beading needles. And you can get the size six beading needles in size, various sizes, size 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Uh, in short or long beads from the Alaska Bead Company is where I like to shop because I believe in shopping local. And then I, I do know that on one corner I have this and it's a razor blade. Okay, I make sure that I have that. I'm surprised that this went through security, but I make sure that I have this so that when I need to cut my fur, I've got this one-sided blade, okay? Because I made the mistake when I was younger and just, you know, experimenting with sewing and I took scissors and I cut the fur. And that was what a disaster that was. You don't want to cut your fur with scissors. You want to make sure that you use this very gently 
to um, get a strip of fur that you might need for your work. Okay, so now I'm going to continue to do this sewing kit looks much different than the one I made for my husband. He sews too. Right now he's working on real tough moose hide and dentalium shells with kids at the Alaska Native Heritage Center. So his case looks much different than mine. Okay, or the contents are much different. Oh, his case is a little wider and I think he's got three pockets that I made for him. This little thing, you could see how little it is. I mean, I'll show you what else I have in here. So I have a fish skin case. That's and then I have uh, pliers because sometimes I'm working with really tough skin and I will need my pliers. Okay, let's put these back in here. Set that down. Let's peek in here again. Okay, let's say I've sewn something and I need to rip stitches out. So we've got this little antler thing here, right? Really cool. So I've got a, looks better on black, seam ripper. So these are some of the items you might wanna have. You also could stick in your uh, traveling ulu, and those would be the real tiny little sewing ulus. Unfortunately, my handle fell off of mine. Other times when I'm traveling to tan salmon skins, I'll put a scraper in, you know, I'll switch things out, and maybe grab my husband's sewing kit and I can load up more tools in it. You know, we've got a skin scraper, these wonderful things that he makes. So when I'm traveling, this is really neat. And I make sure that I have scissors that won't be confiscated from me or try not to have anything in there that's going to be confiscated from me. It's real easy to make this. I start off by cutting my uh, leather for the backing, whatever, whatever you want it to be. It can be canvas. It can be deer skin. This happens to be metallic salmon leather that I got from Iceland. Okay, and I use the sewing machine to stick this together. It could be just one thick, sturdy piece of material that you want and you want to measure it out. And then after you measure, cut and measure that piece out, you're going to have your backing. This rests against this. Okay, and when you cut this out, it will match the back. This will match the back. And then you're going to cut pieces out for that you want to sew on for your needle. So this is nice thick felt. Don't get any of that cheap stuff. Make sure you get something that's going to last a while. Okay. And then I um, cut out the pocket and then folded it and ironed it to fit on top of this really cool material back here. And, and then I took the took this to the sewing machine and just did the zigzag pattern on it, uh, kind of like sewed it down, you know. And then I uh, decided, well, heck, let's add some color. This, this piece of material was gifted to me oh, from one of the Shaganoff, Shaganoff girls, Melissa Shaganoff, up there from the Chickaloon area. And then this was gifted to me from a, a lady here in Sitka, Pam Lehman. And, um, you know, you just take scraps, you, whatever you have. You know, if you've got an old flannel shirt and it's still in good condition, use that, you know, whatever it is. And it's got pockets, right? Those shirts have pockets. It'd be, you know, creative and incorporate a pocket on the inside of your cookie whip, your sewing kit, okay? After I piece all of these on to this fabric, one piece of fabric that's attached to the outer side, then I took a piece of um, some stuff that my mom had in her sewing kit. And it was just these, uh, what do you call that, binding? Bias tape. <laughs> bias tape. Yeah, thank you. I took that bias tape, the wide bias tape, and I started right here, folded it over, did my stitching, went down, came up, came up. Oh yeah, I folded it. I was able to fold it right here, go across, fold it again so that I had a real nice sharp edge, went up here, 
came up here and came up to the top and without cutting anything, left a really long piece of that bias tape so that when I roll this up, see how easy that is? So that when I roll this up, I have a real sturdy way of closing my cookie whip, my sewing kit, okay? So that is how I make the sewing kit for when I'm traveling and I'm working on maybe some small projects like this little bag that I'm working on right here. Okay, the salmon skin bag. Okay, so let's talk about men. What would a man have in his? He would have the exact same thing I've got you know, but, but depending on his project, maybe he needs real long needles if he's working with dentalium shells and making a chief's necklace or, or making bracelets, you know, or maybe he just needs stronger pliers for whatever, you know, you're going to need a need. Some people need needle cases if they're out on a boat, you know, so that they're not poking themselves. And which brings me to, I want to tell you a story about um, so long ago in Nunyak village on Kodiak Island, there was this man, they called him Tuntuk and his name, Tuntuk means uh, caribou. So Tuntuk, and they called him Tuntuk because he had really long legs. And when he was born, his, his grandparents saw that and, and they went, ah, oh, we're gonna name him Tuntuk after the mainland caribou because he got long legs. Well, Tuntuk grew up to be, you know, a, um, a hunter and the chiefs in the village and leaders in the village could see that Tuntuk had, uh, was interested in, he just was interested in everything about hunting. That meant studying the stars and, you know, and how people travel with the stars. It meant knowing the wind, the winter wind, the summer wind from the north, south, east, and west, you know. And he was always interested in taking, a, when he was traveling with the ones that were training him to become a hunter, he was always interested in the coastline, watching, you know, for petroglyphs that could tell him stories. And, you know, some of them they saw, at, um, could see at regular tide. And then some of them were hidden at low tide. When the tide was high, people couldn't read the rocks, you know that would tell stories of maybe where the best fishing places were, who knows, you know. But anyway, Tuntuk had become such an avid hunter. And one day the first chief and the second chief got a hold of him and said, no, you're gonna be the, you're gonna be the uh, chief hunter and that's gonna be your title. And you're also going to be tra training people to take your place and you're, you're gonna have men in your village who are already hunters and they're gonna be training younger ones and even how to position your kayak before you go out to sea, what to take with you. One of the important things that you'll need is your sewing kit, you know, and, and the men, they had their own sewing kit because things could happen when you're out at sea while you're in a skin kayak. One day Tuntuk took his crew out and he was watching the water and he, you know, and the weather. It was so beautiful. The sun was shining and he knew that it was going to be a wonderful trip for, for them to go out fishing and hunting. And he says, okay, we're going to go. We're going to get ready. We're going to put the kayaks out and position them for launching out to sea. And he was at the head, he was, he was a chief hunter. And he said that when we go out to sea, we're gonna follow like the birds. We're gonna go out like the birds. That meant that they had to, when they went out, they traveled like this. They weren't all in uniform following the chief in his kayak. Instead, they were like this. They were, you know, just like the birds when they travel, that's what you see when they're flying in the air. And, and he had a reason for that. And he told them, when we go out there, we're gonna go hunt for sea otter because they're right around the corner, down that bend. And he said, when we get over there, 
it'll be so easy because when I give the signal, when we see sea otter, all of you are in formation for us to make a circle to be around the sea otter that we're gonna get. And then we're gonna pound our oars in the water every time that sea otter comes up. And then that sea otter will be so scared he'll have to put his, dunk his head back in the water and dive down. And each time that sea otter comes up, he was telling this to the young hunters, each time those sea otters come up, they're gonna be tired and more tired and more tired. Well, that day they did catch their sea otter, but later in the evening, the fish were jumping and one of the boys hollered, akalahe, akalahe, jumpers. And he got excited and he sped off in his kayak. What he didn't know was that he was gonna be going over some rocks that would put a rip in his kayak. It happened so quickly, Tuntuk didn't have time to holler out at him but he hollered out at his uh, elder hunters and he said, ah, he's gonna tear his kayak, we gotta go after him. So they did, they went out after him because they knew what was going to happen. And all the men had their sewing kits in their kayak, they knew exactly where it was. And when they got to that, to that young boy, they had to save him because he did end up with a hole in his kayak. And you know what they did? They formed a, a, a formation around a place where they were out at sea, put that young man with his kayak up on a, on a um, spread out sea lion skin that had been rolled up. They lashed their oars together and they put that sea lion, big sea lion skin on there. And that way, that boy was able to get up on there with his damaged kayak, get his sewing bag out, and he had sinew in it. He had his needles, he had awls, he had everything, patches, everything for repairing his kayak. So men had to know how to sew. They had to know what to carry with them when they went out on their hunting trips. It wasn't just their weaponry. It wasn't just their, you know, their harpoons and darts and all that, or and their quills, you know, in the in the quiver. They quivering quills, whatever. They all had to have knowledge and and they knew it. You know, they knew everything. And that's what the older men did. They trained the younger guys by taking them out on those hunts. And incidents like that, you know, um, we always have to be prepared. And to this, to today, we're still prepared. I am so thankful that we grew up in a village. You know, my dad, um, in the winter time, we didn't have a store that we could go to, to buy our groceries from. They prepared, and as fishermen, they spent a lot of their money on groceries that were barged up and they knew how to plan it out so that, you know, our cases of milk will last until springtime when we can go to Kodiak to get more milk. You know, we have to have enough flour for the whole winter. You have to have enough sugar, you know, and, and that's how it was when I was growing up. But I remember stories when dad and my uncles and my grandpa from way up north would talk and grandma would talk about, you know, how it was, how they prepared for the winter. Everything was planned out. And you know what? We could still live like that today. And it's so easy for us who come from the village and that were raised that way to slip into that, you know. The kids and the grandkids come shopping over at my place when they get low because they know we have a case of this, we've got a case of that, we're stocked up on jam, you know, we've got fish in the freezer, we've, uh, we've got deer meat, uh, not deer meat, we've got moose meat that is frozen, we've got it jarred, you know, we've got salmon that's frozen, half smoked, frozen, all ready to eat. There's some for the baby who's teething, you know, and and then if we're um, getting low on store-bought bread, we have flour in the house, we'll just make some 
no recipe involved. You just throw it together and you make your bread and there you go, you know, kids smell it and they come over or know that you're doing it. And then your house is lively and full again. Um, so in preparation, you know, get your kit together and make a homemade one. If you live here in Sitka, take a trip, ooh, take a trip over here to the Sheldon Jackson Museum and, you know, take a look at what um, this beautiful garments and things that the Tlingit people of this area made. You'll see things in there and fish skin sewing bags from Inupiaq people in the Yupik country. You know, unfortunately, he didn't travel down to the Aleutians and to the Aleutic areas where they made beautiful things too. But if you're in Sitka, stop by up here. If you're not in Sitka and you want to view articles that they have, say, I want to look at every sewing bag that you have there. They have staff here who would be glad to share those via, you know, email. They can email you some pictures if you're wanting to make your own bag. So with that said, I think that um, I'm pretty much done talking and I'm not sure how many people we have on here, but if you're interested in any questions, you can raise your hand. And I think I do have a monitor here helping me with those. Robert is here, so. You would have to unmute yourself or Robert would have to un unmute you. I don't see that I have you muted, any of you muted. We have only 13 participants. I don't have a question, but I just really enjoyed that. And I want to thank you so much for that talk. That was really great. Thank you. Oh, Chris, thank you. I'm so glad you were here. Hi, June, it's Jan. Hi, Jan. I haven't made it up there to see you yet. I'm still kind of isolating, but I will come up. Hey, oh, you don't you need to come. Yeah, you don't need to jeopardize your health. You stay right where you're at, you know? And I just want to share something with you, Jan. When I was yeah. just in my 20s, um, way back then, was working for IANA, Indian Native. Uh, Institute of Alaska Native Arts. Oh, yeah, they're, yeah, so, so she, you know, I just want to give a thank you, Jan, for Let's see, back in those days, it was Jan, there was Steve Corey here, there was, um, over the years, there was Rosemary Carlton, um, down in Kodiak, there was Rick Connect, and, you know, those people who really encouraged us when we were young and didn't know we were going to become artists, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, both, okay. both you and your brother, yeah. Jacob. Yeah. Jacob, wonderful yeah. Aleut hat maker. Oh. His yeah. hunting hats were out of this world. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want to know, do you take your sewing bag on the plane with you? Yes. Or do you have to check it? No. I, I, they, don't, I, they, don't, they don't confiscate your scissors or? They won't confiscate your scissors if they're really short like this, because it's not a weapon. And this okay. one folds. This is one of those fold up ones. Oh, and by the way, you can find these over at Seamart. Huh. I okay. saw them. Uh, yeah, they have some there and they have the pliers that I purchased. They're not sharp. They're not, it, it's not a weapon, but these will fit in, in the plane as well. Um, but what I wouldn't put are doll making needles in your sewing kit. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're the super long ones. <laughs> well, I, w I was all set to make a basket, <clears throat> and I had my scissors with me on the plane, and that's the first thing they confiscated. So, <laughs> yeah, they will. So I slept, slept the whole way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Any comments? Yes. Uh, June. Hi, June. This is June Lehman, and I'm sorry I haven't gotten to see you down at the museum, but we. Salon, my grandson and I certainly enjoyed this presentation. Thank oh, that, you. That it's is wonderful. awesome. Now, was he the one that was in the video that you sent me? Yes, yes. He helps me tan skins. He, he's yeah. really into it. 
We oh. made a bag for him the other day too. Oh, that's wonderful. So how long are you in Sitka now? I'm here until the eighth and then I fly out on the okay. night. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll stop in and see you because yeah. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Yeah, I know what these times going on. We want to be careful. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you for joining us. I've got a question for you. Do you hear me? I hear you, Steve. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm Hinda. It says Haley. And okay. I'm in Illinois. So I'm a few hours ahead of you. Yes. I visited that museum when we were in Alaska about two years ago. And it's such a beautiful, not only is the structure magnificent, but the contents are fabulous. So I was happy to see that I'm able to connect. Wow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I have a question for you. Okay. Um, so you're talking about using so many things that we tend to throw away, like fish skin, right? Yes. Most of us just throw away and never think of using it. When I look at like older things from Alaska, I don't think I see much fish skin, but maybe I do. I'm wondering like, in terms of stuff from the 1800s or the early 1900s, what, what's the preservation like for garments and things made with fish skin? The garments, yeah. The, okay, I'm sorry. The garments that they have here are wonderful. I mean, okay. yeah, yeah, they're, they're aged and they're drying, you know, and I'm sure they might need some um, conditioning maybe. But I'm not in that field, but they're they're they really do. You could get a hold of the curator here and anybody here, and and let them know that you're interested in photographs of what they have. But the um, Smithsonian Institute in Washington D.C. has really nice salmon skin specimens, but I think those are stored in Virginia. You know, yeah. but it's all the Smithsonian Institute. You can get a hold of them too. And uh, I've actually visited that. Have you been to that facility? Yes, that's, that's yes, I have. It's an amazing place. Uh, what they're doing there is just fabulous. So yeah, yeah, it is. was there last year. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. How are you? Kleana, oh, who is that? Heather. How are you? I'm fine. So um, uh, those fish skin sewing um, holder, the sewing holder, is that fish skin, is that pretty stiff or did you work that a lot to make it softer? Um, I worked, actually this is really nice. I'll tell you what happened here. This is really nice. I um, used oak gall nut. Yeah. And then I ordered it from Maiwa in Vancouver, BC. It comes in powder form. Mm -hmm. and you have to use it very, very carefully to um, build up the strength of your can and so that you're not case hardening your, your skin. Now, hang on, let me get one more piece. Okay. And this one is oil tanned uh, with coconut oil. Mm -hmm. after okay. putting it in solutions um, but it's a little bit more stiff and I need to work it a little more and here's how I do that and what I do when I get home is I will throw this on the table between me and Charlie where he sits in the <laughs> evening and he can't help himself he'll pick it up and he'll do the softening for me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I've got alder with uh, beets right here, and it it came out just nicely. But here's the softening technique that I do. Friction and heat will make it nice and soft after you've gone through the tanning and the oiling stage of it, okay? And I don't have enough time to walk you through a class right now. Right. Like that. So uh, so the, ta the, t the tannin tanning uh, class, 
So the salmon skins that I have are re still really stiff. I haven't worked them very much. Okay. So do you make them really soft before you make your sewing, your uh, scissor case? Do you, no, work you, don't it have to have, you don't have to have it really, really soft for your scissor case, but I'll tell you okay. what, this, this is pretty soft. Yeah. Okay. You can't even hear any crinkles. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Koyana. E. Okay. So we're all done with our presentation. Thank you, David, for joining us. Everyone, I just absolutely enjoyed connecting with you. Enjoy your evening, you know, and explore making and have fun making your kaki with your sewing kit. Okay, I'm going to sign off now. Thank, Thank you, June. Koyana. Uh, I'll see you later. Thank you.